Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Morning, everybody. My name is Ellen, and I am an Alanonic. When I first got in the program, I hung around with these, you know, I'd go to these meetings and there's all these, you know, pretty little ladies in their skirts. And uh, they'd be going, my name is Susie Q and I'm a grateful member of the Worldwide Fellowship of the al Family Group. But I'd be like going, oh, I, you know, that's too sweet for me. I, I like, you know, going to an AA meeting. It's like, my name is Joe and I'm an alcoholic and, you know. This is how I got here, and I don't want this sweet little, because we used to hang in, if anybody heard Butch last night, that's where I met my husband, is in the same kind of bars that Butch used to hang in. So if I was in Toronto, Butch, we might have had a different story here, I don't know, but um, yeah, we were like beer drinking, flannel wearing, beard growing, softball playing, that's what we did, you know, and when uh, my husband first came in the program, uh, we, uh, we started hanging around with these people, and they're all just like sweet and clean, and uh, I didn't get that at all. But anyway, uh, more about that in a minute. I want to thank the Roundup for inviting me, and Brian, thank you so much. You and your whole crew have just been amazing. I, it's really been awesome so far. And Sheila picked us up at the airport and we've been doing nothing but laughing since. She laughs at anything. She makes me feel like I'm the funniest person on earth. It's like, hi. And she's like, ah, ah, you know. <laughs> See? You can hear her. I, I just, I think I want to move here. She just really makes me feel good about myself. And it's just been, you know, it's uh, it's been uh, great ever since. In the opening meeting last night, the enthusiasm in that room is like not many that I've seen. I've been to a lot of conferences, and um, the people last night, and the, when the guy was reading the traditions, I it was, everybody was having a little problem with the anonymity, if anybody was in here last night, and they, like, carried him through in a big way. <laughs> And then the, you know, the screens are all over the place and the TV in your room. Last night, um, we, we'd been traveling since four o'clock in the morning. I just couldn't do another meeting. So I went up in the room and I put my pajamas on and turned on the TV and I saw Chris on TV. So I just sat there in my pajamas, you know, um, watching a, I should have got some popcorn watching a, a meeting. It's like, it's amazing. Matter of fact, it's so cool. I kind of want to run up to my room and see myself on TV right now, but. I, I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> Maybe you can stand here for me and I'll be right back. I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, um, like I said, I do I do call my, myself an Ellen Arc because I really don't believe that there's a whole lot of difference between us, between AAs and al People might disagree with me, but um, I saw an AA speaker one day and he was talking about how he didn't feel good enough, and he didn't feel handsome enough, he didn't feel smart enough, and when he would drink, of course, you know, he would feel better. And I, I believe that, um, I, you know, I never felt smart enough, and I never felt pretty enough, and I never felt, you know, whatever enough, but if I um, get the world spinning in the right direction, if I get everybody tied up in their neat little packages sitting in their frame right and I, you know, smooth it all out and everybody's happy, well, then I'm happy now. So my drug of choice is thinking. I can think myself into anything. And I can prove it, too, because if you take the um, – I always bring my How Al Now Works book with me, and I have a bunch of things in here, but um, – if you take the questions about are you an alcoholic, and everywhere they have the word drink in there, if you take that out and put in the word think, that is so us. And I'm just going to read a couple of them for you. The first one being, is thinking making your home life unhappy? <laughs> is thinking affecting your reputation? <laughs> Has your ambition decreased since thinking? I, I used to have this this swivel rocker chair in the picture window of our of our house, and um, Pat would be on one of his unannounced trips where he would uh, he would go to work and 
you know, they would get rained out because he works outside in construction. He's a lineman. And um, they would go to the bar for a beer. And then three days later, he'd call me from two states over and doesn't know how he got there which I always thought was a bunch of bull crap. Like, how could you drive two states and not, you know, you did it? I mean, how stupid do you think I am? Blackouts, really? Kiss my... <laughs> Whatever. But anyway, so I'd be sitting in the picture window, swiveling and rocking and swiveling and rocking, and he's done something yet again. And how am I going to get rid of this guy? He makes me nuts. And then I would think to myself, he's a lineman. He used to climb those big you know, 200 foot towers. And I would think to me, and they would, they drink at work. Oh, by the way. And, um, when he was in rehab, they sent me this form to fill out. And they said, you know, did he ever get in trouble at work drinking? And I said, he got in trouble if he wasn't drinking. I mean, they all drank. And I was so in my swivel rock here and I'm thinking to myself, he needs to just get drunk and climb to the top of that tower and fall off and die. And then my life would be perfect, you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> And we're from Chicago, and in Chicago, funerals are, like, productions. They're like this. They're like this. And I would be the, what is your title? I'd be the, the headboard member of the funeral. And um, Pat's half Irish and half Italian, and nobody does a funeral like um, Dago's and the Irish. I mean, it would be... So I'm sitting in my chair, and, and then he's dead, and I'm thinking, no, first I'm thinking he had a car accident, and I'm thinking and thinking, and the doorbell rings, and there's police at the door, hat in hand, they're so sorry, my husband was drunk and died in a car accident, and I thought, no, that's not good, he might have killed somebody else, go back to my chair. <laughs> I'm swiveling, I'm rocking, I'm swiveling, I'm rocking, the doorbell rings again, it's the guys from work. He did climb to the top of that tower, and he fell off, and now he's dead. And these guys, whenever anything happens, they just take up a collection. So they took up a collection, and now they're giving me money. They're giving me all his effects. They're bringing his check, and now I got money, and I've murdered him. Like, come on. Life is perfect. So then I plan the, the, I plan the wake, and we both have funeral homes in our family. So I got Kenny Brothers instead of whatever Italian place he wanted to go, and I got him all laid out in his finest suit, and um, the you know then the people from the union come and they give me the check, the um, your husband's dead check, I don't know what you call it, but <laughs> I got a lot of money and now I can live without him, and I, he's not bugging me, and you know of course he fell off the tower, so I'll sue the company, and then I'll have more money, and you know life is great, and I got everything I need, and he's gone, and life is wonderful. Except I, I forgot that in the middle of this, I was stone cold crazy anyway, and that wasn't going away with or without him and with or without the money. He was just kind of the, the, the egg in my cake mix that, you know, made me, he like set it off. You know, I had this before I got here, and he was my e-ticket ride that just set me over the edge. So anyway, that really wasn't a good plan at all, but it was good to think about it for a while. <laughs> I got a couple of more. Oh, yeah. Does thinking cause you to have difficulty in sleeping? Um, oh, uh, hell yeah. And then, of course, do you think alone? <laughs> of course I think alone. Do you think I want your input in it? No. I can really go pretty far with this up here. I don't need anybody else. Oh, and then... This one really bugs me. Have you ever been to a hospital or an institution on account of your thinking? And um, that really pisses me off because while he's in 30 days rehab, who's putting up with the bill payers? Who's listening to the relatives? What's wrong with you two? What's going on in your house? Why can't you get yourself together? And here's Pat in rehab making moccasins and wallets like... <laughs> Like Dr. Bob talk, or Dr. Uh, Paul talks about in the big book. And I'm thinking to myself, ah, I never got any stinking moccasins or wallets out of it. I don't get the vacation. I don't get the moccasins. I get the family. But do I need al -Anon? Hell no. Do I want to look like those ladies that are all perfectly looking and happy and, you know, no. I'm going to stay home. So anyway, how did, I, how did we how did we end up getting here? 
Um, we're both from Chicago. We live in California now, but originally we're from Chicago and uh, South Side. And, and uh, we met in a tavern. I love taverns. I was just listening to you last night. I had a little different angle on it because I'm on this side. But um, I love taverns. It's like cheers, only only night is not, not as nice as a, of a bar, but you go in there and everybody knows you. In Chicago, in a regular neighborhood full of houses, it'll be a house, a house, a tavern, a house, a house, a house. You know, taverns are everywhere. And um, we uh, met at Brandt's Tavern on 95th Street in Oak Lawn, where we played on their softball team and we bowled there and the vendors would come and, um, you know, put on big parties. We had bus trips to Comiskey Park to watch the White Sox play. And I mean, it was a party, a party, party, party. And that's where that was our other family, much like this one, but way more dysfunctional. But it was a lot of fun. So I'm in there one night with my girlfriends and I see this guy and he's really good looking. And I thought, hmm, this guy's good looking. And um, a little while later, I, he went to buy a drink and he brings out this big fat wad of money. And I'm like, and he's rich too. <laughs> and then I got to meet him before the night was over, and he was a lot of fun. And you know, I'm thinking to myself, he's good looking, he's got money, he's a lot of fun. I, I'm throwing my hook into this sucker. So I did, you know, and I reeled him on in, and we started dating, and uh, it was just crazy. One day he said to me, "We're in Chicago," and he goes, "You want to go see my friend that I was in the service with?" And I'm like, "Yeah, sure." Where is it? And he goes, "Buffalo." And so we got in his car, uh, his little Volkswagen, and we drove to Buffalo, New York for the weekend. Well, you know, no reason, no thought behind it. We just did it. And I was like, whoa, this guy's crazy. I love it. Let's go. I didn't know what crazy train I was getting on. but. And then on the way back, we got three flat tires. And um, we made it to, where were we, in Indiana? We're in Indiana. It's late. His grandfather um, was a Cook County Sheriff in Illinois, and by the third flat tire, and it was late, we couldn't get another tire, so we called him up. And so he comes in his squad car. I don't know what time it was, like 2 o'clock in the morning. He's got the Mars lights going in the parking lot. He's got his pajama bottoms on with his sheriff jacket. And he comes in the bar, and everybody's looking like, oh, what's going on here? And he's like, come on, let's go. So we get in there, and, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, and his grandfather's crazy, too. Another one, whoa. Let's just hook up to this happy train and go. I, uh, so I did. And so we dated for a while. We ran amok. We had so much fun. And one day Pat says to me, hey, um, hey, you ought to look at the time. Oh, crap. I'm already got a lot going. Um, he goes, hey, you want to move in together? And I said, move in together? Have you met my mother? She's like the Irish form of Mother Teresa. There's no way that I can move in and sin. No, 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 no. So we're sitting around a little while. And then afterwards he says, well, uh, you want to get married? I was like, yeah, okay. So we did. <laughs> we didn't do any of that Dr. Laura stuff, like um, how many kids do you want to have? Um, do you want to go to work every day? <laughs> Are you going to stay within the confines of the state of Illinois? You know, stuff like that. We just thought, wouldn't that be a hell of a party? And it was. We had this this ridiculously crazy wedding and um matter of fact we went back to my mom's house and we were opening up envelopes and we had to like feel them when we opened them because they had you know like um chunks of hash and stuff <laughs> it was crazy and then of course where do you go for your honeymoon acapulco and um we're lucky we got back in and so anyway we get back in we're married for a while and i um um uh, i got pregnant and so I thought, white picket fence time, you know, let's, let's get this thing together. And so, um, I, I had a, a baby boy. As a matter of fact, he was, he was conceived on New Year's Eve. We, um, we had, I had had a miscarriage months before and we were feeling really sad. We, you know, we're drinking. We're, you know, we lost a baby. Ooh, let's go make another one. Ooh. And the next day we get up, we're going, you think? <laughs> it was New Year's Eve. I'm not sure if something happened, but September that year, it was our bicentennial baby, and I was so excited, you know, now we were going to be a family and um, all this and settle down, and so uh, it's the day to, for me to go home from the hospital, and uh, I'm waiting for Pat to come and bring me clothes and the baby clothes, and he wasn't coming, he wasn't coming, and my mom came because she was going to come stay with us for a little while. Pat doesn't come. I call him up, ring, 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 the phone's ringing, and um, he didn't answer, so... 
surely he's on his way. He didn't come, he didn't come. So they bring me the baby from the nursery. He went home with a shirt that said Property of Christ Hospital. I wore the clothes I came in on, and uh, we went home. I get there, and Pat's standing on the porch, and he's got this look on his face like there was something he was supposed to do today. <laughs> Can't remember what it was. But he always says that um, uh, he, he was he was actually really scared to death because he thought my mom was going to kill him. He thought she had a knife. He was a nice little sweet little Irish lady, but don't cross her. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh uh-uh, uh, don't cross her. But anyway, so we get in, and I'm like, Patsy, what happened to you? You know, your baby boy, the future quarterback in Notre Dame, is who we decided he was going to be. Wait till he's like big on Sundays playing football. I'm going to tell him you left him at the hospital. But anyway, he's like, I am so so sorry, so sorry. He says, and I promise I'll never do it again, Butch. <laughs> He said that last night, too. Uh, Yeah, I'm not going to do it again. And so, you know what? I bought that hook, line, and sinker every time because I wanted it to be that way. And I I think there was something deep down inside me that knew that he did, too. But for some reason, he just couldn't hit the mark. He just couldn't hit the mark. He would sail along for a while doing really well, and something would happen. And I I, I actually kind of developed this sixth sense about him. You know, I could see it. There was something in his eyes, and I'd know that, you know, you're going to the bar tonight, buddy, and something's going to be bad, and you're, we're going to a wedding, and I got this really bad feeling, like a lumbago, you know, my elbow hurts, we're in trouble. And he'd be going to me, nag, 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 that's all you do is nag. Are you ready? No wonder I drink you're such a nag. (laughs) So that was like, License to go off to the races, and he'd go again, and then he would do something awful, and then he would get pitiful and inconsequential, hemp- incomprehensible demoralization, which in my house was called the punes, and he would feel really bad, and he would apologize, apologize, promise he'd never do it again, and so then I got to the point of where when this happened, I could get anything I wanted out of him. I could have him painting the house or rebuilding something. I could get him to the ballet. I could get whatever I wanted, so I actually had this pre-printed list, and as, as soon as we'd go through the whole thing, I'd tack that sucker on the fridge, and I'd be like... Go to it, and he'd be out there hammering, paying, <laughs> sewing sequence on a tutu, you know, <laughs> getting ready to go. And um, after, you know, uh, to tell you the truth, since sobriety, he hasn't done a damn thing. I can't. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was kind of a pretty useful way to live, actually. I, I don't know how to motivate him anymore. But anyway, um, this is this was our life, and it was you know a big old pile of shit, and uh, you know. But after a while, you know, it's soft, it's warm. You can kind of hunker down in it a little bit. It smells a bit, but you get over it, you know. I mean, and that's what it, things were like. But as time was going by. He kept getting worse and worse, and things, were, and I was getting crazier and crazier. And one day he did take a trip, went to work, um, and we were in California by then. We were living in California. He went to work, and he didn't come home. A couple days later, he called me, and he was in Las Vegas. Las Vegas? Okay, Las Vegas. And he said, it's over. It's over. Like, are you kidding me? It's like having the worst job you hated your whole life, and you get fired before you have the pleasure of quitting. And I'm going... You, wait, you're dumping me? <laughs> Come on, you're dumping me? No way. I said, okay, fine. You want to dump me? I'm going to, you're dead, sucker. I'm taking you for everything you've got. And he's like, whatever. I'm having fun in Las Vegas. And I said, okay, fine. So I go and I call a lawyer. And where we lived, you could get a divorce, beginning to end, 30 days. Bam, you're done. So I go to the lawyer's office and, um, Excuse me. He's got out that big sheet of legal paper, and um, he says, um, "Thank you." Um, I said, I, "You know, I want a divorce. I want it quick, and I want everything." And he goes, "All right. What do you got?" And he's ready to write. And I was like, "Well, um, we own a house, but it's kind of months behind in the mortgage and credit card bills, utility bills, bills, bill." I used to call him Bill Lavin. I mean, his name was Pat. I called him Bill. Bill Lavin. We we were so financially crazy, it was nuts. But he goes, all right, well, here, get get this form. Get him to sign it. Sign the house over to you, and we'll get this deal done. And 
I got him to sign the house over to me. I don't even know, you know, I couldn't afford that either. And we were off to the races. He came home. He grabbed what, well, what little there was in the house because I threw all his clothes out. But um, I, like, got him out of there before he even got back from Las Vegas. But anyway, it, we were on. He was moving to California because he married the wrong wife. He lived in the wrong house. He had the wrong kids. He had the wrong job. He even had the wrong car. And in California, sunny Southern California, life was going to be great. So I was like, fine, good riddance, sucker. Where do you see me? I'm, I'm on. So then as, you know, he left and now we have two kids and now I'm home with two kids. I've got a part-time job. We couldn't pay the bills when we had two people there. Um, you know, the kids are crazy. My life's insane. Now I'm trying to find a job and the kid, you know, I'm just nuttier than a fruitcake. You know, the kids get up in the morning and they want breakfast and I'm like, what the hell? I fed you last night. You gotta eat all the time. <laughs> I like something to do, you know, kick rocks, I don't care, you know, the relatives are calling, what's going on, and the bill payers want money, and I'm lying to them, and um, I'm, you know, I'm trying to find a job, and everything's crazy, and all my friends, all my family, all my family from the bar, my good, good buddies, you know, where are they, where are they, they weren't at my house, my mom said to me, Al, did your friends bring you over a loaf of bread today? Has anybody uh, asked you if you need some uh, help with a bill? You know, anything like that? Nothing. And my life got crazier and crazier and crazier every day. But every day, all day long, I was so busy, um, you know, with the kids and trying to find a job and uh, fielding phone calls and all this other kind of stuff that I just ran all day long. And then at night, I would lay down in bed. And it was like dust was settling on me, and I, I was, I was afraid, and I was alone, and I was ashamed, and I was so, so hurt. And I, I had all these millions of feelings going through me, and, and I didn't know what to do, and I didn't know where to go. And um, this is when I considered just checking out. I saw on TV one time this guy talking about um, he wanted to kill himself. He wanted to die, kill himself. But it wasn't that he really wanted to die. It's like being out in the water and hanging onto a log. And after a while, your arms hurt so bad. All you want to do is let go of that log for a while. And that's how my, I felt. My heart hurt so bad. I just wanted it to stop. I just wanted the calls to stop. I just wanted the nonstop nonsense to stop. I just really wanted to check out. I want somebody else to come in here and take over this for me. And it, and it didn't happen. So then as time goes on, I find out... I. I'm pregnant. I don't even know how that happened. It, uh, Pat says he does. I t he doesn't remember it, I know, but he says he knows. But anyway, I find out I'm pregnant. I've got two little kids I can't take care of. I'm trying to find a full-time job. Uh, who's going to hire me when I'm pregnant? Who's going to take care of these kids after I have a baby and I can't work, you know, because he's crazy and gone, and all these things are going through my head. And this is when I hit my bottom, my bottom, and I decided this kid's got to go. It's just got to go. Uh, and it's something for me that is totally against the way I feel. Abortion is not an option for me. But I felt I, I felt I had no other. And so I crashed and I burned and I just, I just fell apart. Like this is when I really hit it. And, um, my mom found out I was pregnant, and she said, and I didn't tell her my plan, but she said, Al, you don't worry about it, you know, you come home, we'll figure this out. And so um, I did. And, uh, well, no, I, I didn't come home with her, but I stayed at my house for a bit longer, and then I heard from Pat, and he had made it out to California, and through his own story, had made it into rehab and out in Palm Springs, and um, he was doing better, and they started calling me. These happy people again started calling me. This counselor was calling me, the family counselor, and she was like, Ellen, can you, you know, can you come out to California and, uh, participate with us? I said, I can't barely feed my kids. I can't come out to California and participate. So she started calling me on the phone all the time and she would always start out, hi, Ellen, it's Susie Q. I don't remember her name, the poor thing. But um, how are you doing today? And I'm like, how am I doing? I'm doing crappy. <laughs> you know. So one day she called me. She's like, hi, Elliot, Susie Q. How are you? How are you doing today? And I'm like, how am I doing? I will tell you how I'm doing. I just got a 17-page letter. Pat was doing some cathartic writing and rehab. He took a break from his moccasins. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> So he sent me this 17-page letter, and it basically was, Dear Ellen, 
You always, you never. You wouldn't, you couldn't, you shouldn't, you didn't. So I start reading it to her, and I'm like, listen to this. Dear Ella. And it's not like that. It was like this. And let me tell you the story, because I got a story behind it all. I am here. And she goes, oh, my God, that's awful. How do you feel? And I'm like, I feel terrible. Page two. Boom. <laughs> And I mean, page three, page four, page five. And this poor chick, every time I take a breath on a page, she'd say, how does that make you feel? And I'm like, how stupid is this lady? How does it make you feel? How does it make you feel? So anyway, finally, I get to the 17th page, and I'm done and <gasps> exhausted. What does she say? How does it make you feel? How do you feel? How do you feel? And I'm like... Why? What do you think I feel? I'm pissed. And she said, yeah, I know. What else? And I said, and I'm hurt. And she said, yeah, I know. And I'm scared and I'm ashamed and I'm all those feelings that I had in my bed that I, that I, every night when I would go to bed. And she said, yeah, I know. And she said to me, and you know what? You don't have to do this by yourself anymore. There's other people just like you. And I'm like, yeah, right. Just like me? I don't think so. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. And she said, tell, tell me a little bit about what's been going on. And I have been hiding this stuff or sugarcoating this stuff to make it more palatable to the rest of the world for so long that I was fluffing it up for. And I, I told her a little bit about what was going on, and she wasn't too impressed. I was like, Phew, all right, fine. So I told her a little more. And then I told her a little more, and she still wasn't impressed. So then I finally was like, Bleh, you know, and I told her everything that's been going on and, um, you know, some pretty nasty stuff. And um, she wasn't impressed. She didn't think I was stupid. She didn't think I was a fool. She didn't, you know, think all these horrible things about me because that's why I couldn't, I couldn't tell. There were so many obvious things going on that people could see if I really told them what was going on behind closed doors. It, 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 they would die. They wouldn't believe it. I mean, our house in front, you would pull up in front of our house, and we, had, we did have a little white picket fence around the flower bed, and the flowers were there, and the bushes were trim, and the grass, we had it painted green with that Kemlon crap. I mean, it, oh, it was awesome. But you walked through that front door, and it was like the first 15 minutes of Saving Private Ryan. It was just like bedlam. <laughs> And I could not lend anybody into my Saving Private Ryan part, but I told this chick what was going on, and um, she was telling me that, you know, I said, I don't have to do this alone anymore, and, you know, there's Al-Anon, and I was like, Al-Anon, Al-Anon's for those poor, wimpy little wives who have these drunken idiot husbands. <laughs> <laughs> like Blake Sheldon, <laughs> that don't go to work. Go out of town, <laughs> you know, all this kind of stuff. And all they do, and I'm thinking to myself, I know what Al Anon is. It's all these blue hair old ladies sitting in the dark, dank basements of some church. They're all knitting, swapping chicken recipes, and telling me what to do to make my man come home. And I don't need that. Thank you very much. Of course, <laughs> the funny part is nobody told me that. I, I didn't read it anywhere. I just made it up. And uh, <laughs> then I believed it. Alanonic, that's the Alanonic part of me. And so, uh, anyway, he stayed in California and I, uh, started going to meetings out in, back in Chicago and Pat called me and, you know, I could tell there was a difference. I could tell there was a difference in him. He, uh, and then when I saw him, he looked different. He, he was in and out for a few years before and, um, it just wasn't real. As a matter of fact, I have, like, radar now for people who aren't serious, so watch out. But um, I knew I knew he was ready, and, and uh, we ended up, long story short, because I got more stories, getting back together, both in the program, 31 years, coming up on 32 in the fall, and um, it's a big, major part of our Oh. It's only because we're that old, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I first came and people had like 10 years, I'm like, holy crap, how dumb is that chick? You can't get 10 years and you don't get this yet? But I used to think to myself, oh, my God, we went to this New Year's Eve party one year when he was in the program. There were six people in the basement of a church, and I was like, oh, what have you done to me now? 
my life is over. <laughs> but I'm telling you, our time is filled with, you know, conventions and conferences and speaking and our friends and barbecues and um, retreats that aren't retreats because we don't have retreats, but we do have retreats. And, uh, you know, all this other kind of stuff. And the friends that I have today are... Uh, they're amazing. You know, you sneeze, there's four of them at the front door with spaghetti and, you know, I mean, they're <laughs> Kleenex and the whole thing. I mean, it, 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 you, you know, you, you need, you think you need, you want, boom, they're there. And I'm there for them. They tend to my heart and I tend to theirs. And, uh, you know, and I met some new hearts this weekend, which is the way this program is. I've met people all over the United States and, and it's just changed, you know, our life amazing. Um, and if you stick around in this program long enough, you're, you get to have miracles. You get to have quarter miracles, Chris, huh? I heard your quarter story last night and I was in bed like, ooh. But, um, when I was a kid, my, I didn't have any grandparents. My last grandparent died when I was three. My father, um, was diagnosed with cancer when I was 13 and died a year and a half later. So really all there was was my mom and, uh, me and my three sisters. My mom was everything to us. She was our mom. She was our dad. She was our grandparents. She was everything. My mom walked on water. I just, she was the sweetest, nicest, kindest, most loving person I have ever met. And the ballsiest chick I ever met too, which I like that too. But, um, when we moved to California, as a matter of fact, I cried all the way to the airport. Pat's dad took us and, and his wife and, um, I'm in the car and I'm like, Aah! Like nobody said a word. They were all like, just get her out of the car, <laughs> get her on the plane. But I, I talked to her every Saturday because we couldn't talk during the week because it was long distance and it was cheaper on Saturday. And she would call me every Saturday and she'd say, morning, sunshine, what's new? And we'd start our conversation every Saturday. And of course, she would call me at like seven o'clock or six o'clock in the morning because it's later in Chicago than it is in California. And the phone would ring and I'd be like, Ugh! Did he not tell you the phone later? You know, but we would talk and, and I loved her to death. And one Saturday she called me up and she said, Al, I, I've got something to tell you. I've been diagnosed with uh, lung cancer and they're giving me six months to a year to live. And I ended the conversation pretty quick and I was devastated. Devastated for me. Not, not for her. For me. What am I going to do without my mom? Anyway, as time, I haven't told this story for a while. Um, as time went on, me and my sisters, because we're all over the place, would go back to my mom's house and we watched old movies and, you know, with all these old, you know, old ladies and she'd tell us who they were and when we were babies and we talked about a lot of things and it was, it was great. And at the end, uh, towards the end, she was living by herself and wouldn't, wouldn't leave. And, um, my one sister that lives in Chicago was really, exhausted from juggling her job, her kids, my mom. So I decided to take seven weeks off work and I went to stay with my mom. And um, just incredible. We would sit on the couch some days and not say anything at all. Or she'd sit on the couch and tell me about my dad who I never knew as an adult. And she would tell me how she couldn't stand him when she first <laughs> met him. And he kept pursuing her. And anyway, the rest was history. But as sweet and nice and kind as my mom was, she had this one little flaw, this one tiny little flaw. My mom grew up on the south side of Chicago, and my mom was prejudiced. My mom did not like people of color at all. And so as time went by, they, as she needed um, a caretaker to come in and help give her a bath and stuff. And um, who does God send my mom but the biggest, darkest black-skinned woman I ever met in my life. And she would come in the door, and um, she knew, she could tell my mom didn't like her, because if my mom didn't like you, you knew. And she wouldn't look at her, and she would hardly talk to her, and um, Dolores would come in every day singing, knowing my mom didn't like her, and give her her bath, and uh, I would be talking to Dolores, and after a while, um, even though my mom didn't like that Dolores was in her house, she didn't like a conversation going on without her. So my mom gets in the conversation. And then as time went by even more, I would leave and they would do the bath and now when it was done they would go and sit on the couch in the living room and, and they would talk and they started to become friends and, and Dolores would leave and my mom would say Al, do you know Dolores has a son that went to college? And I'm like, no. <laughs> He's an attorney. And I'm like, oh my God, Ma, they have attorneys? 
I don't know. Someday, they might have a president. <laughs> she didn't live to see that one, but I don't know. Anyway, so now she's bragging to me about her new friend, and it was really something. So the seven weeks go by, and every day, you know, they're showing pictures and telling stories and, you know, uh, places they've been and where she used to dance at the train on and on Garfield Boulevard and blah, 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 and the seven weeks are over, and it's the last day, and my mom's going to move over to my sister's house now because she's getting worse and um, can't live by herself anymore, and I'm going back home. And Dolores comes for the last time, and she gives her her bath. And they go and they sit in the living room, and they chatted a little more. And then um, when Dolores left for the last time, they were hugging each other, and my mom had tears in her eyes because she knew she wasn't going to see her friend anymore. And I saw right there that God had done for her what she couldn't do for herself. He knew that she was coming and that she had this piece of hate in her heart that she needed to take care of or not, her choice. And he laid out that whole scenario for her to take or not take. And she took it, and she um, moved to my sister's house, and it was like six weeks later that she just went to sleep and um, didn't wake up again. And uh, she was gone. And so <laughs> we all went back to Chicago, and I did her eulogy because you guys – taught me how to do this stuff and we laughed our ass off in the church and we cried and matter of fact me and my sisters went we went to the bank because she had a cd that came due and uh, my mom was always worried we'd fight over her money we go to the bank and it's whatever whatever dollars and two cents and there and there's four of us so uh my sister well, yeah, they're going to cut a check in four spots and so my oldest sister goes well i i want a penny because i'm the oldest and <laughs> The second goes, well, I want that penny because I'm the executor. And I said, obviously, I want the penny because I'm the favorite. <laughs> and then my younger sister goes, well, I'm the baby. I get everything. And so, and this poor chick at the bank is just sitting there like, oh, no, what am I going to do? Like, I'm going to throw in two cents to shut up and get out of here. You know? <laughs> and, you know, like I said, we laughed and we cried through the whole thing. And we went to the mass. And uh, that's where I did the eulogy. And, and when... Um, uh, when, you know, it was over, we walked out, um, I walked out behind her and smiling. I think, how often do you go to a funeral and you see people smiling on the way? I mean, I, in my heart and the faith I, I came to this program with that I got through my mom and the bolstered up from being here. I know I'm going to see her again. I know that I'm going to die and I'm going to be outside heaven and I'm going to be here and you, <laughs> We'd be out shopping, and she, she'd lose me, and she'd be like, Al, where are you? <laughs> and my kids are going, Ma, you make her stop? And I said, get over yourself. She's done it to me my whole life. Fuck up, little camper. Pay the price, you know. <laughs> anyway, wait, i got to see where I'm at. Okay, i got time for another story. <laughs> anyway, but these are the kind of gifts that I've gotten in this program. I see things that I never saw before. You know, I'll be driving down the street, and the beautiful sky is like, hey, good job, God. Thank you, God. And where I go to my meeting, um, they don't have it anymore, but they used to have these, like, um, special ed uh, kids come in. Uh, or they're older, like young young people, and they would, you know, water and uh, sweep and do all this other kind of stuff. And we'd be walking in a meeting, and they're, they're, um, oh, they're just happy. They're just happy. And, you know, hey, Martin. And we'd stop, and we would talk to them. And um, you know what? They don't, they don't worry about uh, the car that they drive or the house that they have. They're just happy, just happy to be. And I would just sit there, and I would watch these kids through the window during the meeting and think, good job, God. Good job. All these things that I, that, you know, that I've noticed. It's just, uh, I, I thought my, I always tell everybody I have friends not in the program and I'll say something I've learned in the program. They don't know I got it here and I'm not telling them because I don't want to think I'm smart. But, um, <laughs> they're like, God, you're so smart. I'm like, how do you know all this stuff? And my one friend I did say, well, I was in a bar one day on 95th Street in Oak Lawn and I met this drunk and he ruined my life. And then I went to Al and and now I'm smart. And she just goes, what? But 
I, we've been in this program for a while. You guys clapped at 31 years, but don't think that we're better because um, a few years ago we uh, went back to Chicago for um, my nephew's wedding. And um, when we lived in Chicago, I mean, it was it was like balls out, uh, bring it on. We were always in some kind of trouble. And so my sister whose son was getting married, they're perfect. They're, they are the people that you guys say that there aren't any. Oh, hell to the yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> My sister, her name is Donna, Donna Reed, uh, Donna. I mean, she, her and her husband are both successful, you know, both have master's degrees. They have three good-looking kids. They're always athletic. They all have master's degrees. <laughs> These kids have never been in jail. Like, what? <laughs> who, has, who has kids that have never gone to jail? I mean, come on. No tattoos, no nothing. Oh, well, one of them does have a little tiny little shamrock on her hip, and my sister almost had to be hospitalized over it. I mean, so anyway, these they're perfect, and their name's O'Toole, so every year they would have this uh, St. Patrick's Day party where their friend, dipshit, would make these perfectly timed party tapes that would start out kind of slow, and then as everybody's cocktailing, they'd get a little jiggy, and we'd be dancing, and then they would perfectly time down. I mean, who does this? Everything was perfect. So we go out to their house, and they're like 45 minutes away. We go to, we're partying, we're drinking, we're having fun. And my sister says, don't go home, you guys. You know, it's too far. My mom had our kids, and she said, spend the night. So we spend the night. So we're in one of the kids' rooms. I don't know where their kids were. They were someplace else, too. So we're in the room, and um, and I wake up in the middle of the night, and I hear this this sound. And there's wood floors in there, and I wake up, and there's Pat peeing in the corner. And I can hear it on the floor, on their perfectly, perfectly buffed wood floors. And it was kind of a funky room, and it had more than four corners in it. And I go over there, and I smack him in the head, and I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> the bathroom's down the hall, for Christ's sake. What are you doing the floors? So he bounced off a couple more walls, and he's hit the other corner, and I'm, jeez. So the next day, you know, we're cleaning it all up. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, the perfect, they're not perfect anymore. It, Next year rolls along, they are having another party, they invited us again, get out the perfectly timed party tapes, green beer, woohoo, everybody's drinking, partying, having a good time. They say, don't drive back home, it's too far. Um, stay. So this time now we're in the basement. And, uh... <laughs> So, Pat's story, he wakes up in the morning, and it's bright, like there's really big windows, and um, he's in a bed, and he turns over to one side, and he sees my brother-in-law, <laughs> <laughs> and my brother-in-law, he wears contacts, but his glasses are like this thick, so he's got, and back then, the you know, the they're like this, and Pat turns around, and there's Bob, and his eyes are like this, and he's like... <laughs> And so he starts yelling for his wife, Donna, Donna, where are you, Donna? And Pat turns this way, and there's Donna. (laughs) And, of course, they're in their bed under their perfectly ironed sheets and their perfectly ironed jammies. (laughs) And Pat's on top, uh, laying on top of the covers, buck-ass naked. So, so um, <laughs> I, I don't know if they ever had another St. Patrick's Day party after that, <laughs> but we haven't been invited. So, uh, but these are the kind of things that they all know about us. And so um, now here we are. We were like what, 25, 23 years, 22, so in our mid 20s uh, sobriety, and we're going back to Chicago. We're heading to Chicago for a wedding. We're in program, right? Mm-hmm. We got it going on. We are serene. We're like, ooh. But my Alanonic is kicking in a little bit because I got to make sure everybody behaves. So I uh, I call up my son and I go, look, Kyle, um, 
We're going to Chicago for the wedding, and this is post 9-11, so security's pretty tight, so, um, and he was a pothead. I'm like, I, I, I think you need to leave your pot at home, okay? Because, like, I don't want to ruin the whole trip, uh, because he actually did get caught in an airport one time, they're gonna arrest him, and they let him go at the last minute. And, and I, so leave your pot at home, because, um, we can't, uh, I, I, we can't start out the wedding like that. Mm-mm, no, 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 no. And then, um, and I told my daughter, and tell your husband too, because he likes pot, and, uh, <laughs> I'm telling this one, that, and the other one, and then I say to Pat, because my a, a different brother-in-law works for Walmart. He's a manager at Walmart, and Pat's a union official, and that does not gel, Walmart and unions, you know. And I said, now, Pat, like, lay off the Walmart bashing for the weekend, please. And um, what are you wearing? I got to see it. What are you wearing? I got to see your suit. Suit tie. Got to be a tie. Kate, where's your dress? I don't like those shoes. Get a new pair. You know, I am, <laughs> I am like... Making my little dollhouse, I am bringing, oh, and then my daughter-in-law has tats, and I'm like, Kyle, can you, like, get some sleeves on the chick? I mean, you know, let's, my mom's sister is there, Mother Teresa's sister, ooh, it's like, ugh. So we go to the wedding. Oh, we go to the wedding. We're at the church. They look, Mwah! My kids are all handsome, beautiful, everything. We go to the reception. We had a ball. And our youngest son was just a couple months short of 21. And all the other kids were old enough to drink. And so we were like, go ahead, have a, have a few with him. And Casey really didn't drink. And he didn't really know about it. And he is, like, drinking anything he saw on a table. And he's like, woo, he's on the dance floor, like, woo, 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 you know, like, it's boozes flying everywhere, and he's drunker than shit, but whatever. We got through the reception, and I'm done, and I'm like, oh, the lavins have come. We've done it all. We did good. They look good. Nobody got arrested. It's woo. And I'm leaving the reception, and then I run into that idiot with perfectly timed party tapes, and he's always looking for something wrong with us. He's always like, yeah, yeah, nitpicking, and he says, hey, uh, you better go over there and check your boys. And I'm like, my boys? What do you mean, my boys? My boys are fine. Thank you very much. And he goes, really? Because uh, two of them are rolling down the uh, hallway fighting. And I'm like, you're crazy. Get out of here. And they're like, uh, no, you better come. Anyway, what had happened is uh, our youngest son had, had quite a bit to drink. And then uh, Pat decided it was time for him to go to bed. Like, who tells somebody when the party is still going on? Yeah. I think you need Alan on, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, I think you've had enough, and I think that, you know, shut this thing down and go to bed. And he's like, no way! And, he, <laughs> and Pat's like, yeah! And anyway, this whole argument ensued, and then they started arguing about it, and somehow or other it got physical, and the two of them are rolling down the hallway, this big crowd comes, and next thing you know, uh, SWAT comes in from like four different aisles. They're in full SWAT gear. You know, they got helmets on, they've got this, they, and they're like, uh, and they're coming down the hall, and it sounds like something on TV, it's like, dun, 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 dun. And so my kid sees that, and he flies out. It's winter time. It's freezing. He's got a shirt and pants on, no, no coat. He leaves. Pat's yelling, oh, I got a heart problem, you know. And I'm, and I'm like, and you're rolling down the hill, and everybody's yelling and fighting, and the cops are going, where's the boy? We need the boy. And I'm like, I don't know where the boy is. And I'm screaming, and I'm yelling, and I'm like, what's the matter with you? How could you ruin this for me? <laughs> Didn't I lay enough groundwork for everybody? Buddy, did you get your memos? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> and it was like bedlam on bedlam. Crazy, crazy craziness. So anyway, finally, my sister found my son. He went to bed, you know, and we're, we are at a different hotel and I'm driving back to the hotel and I'm like, what's the matter with you? Why did you do this to me? What's the, you know, I'm like crazy. I was like crazy. And then I get back and I'm calling a friend of mine back to California and I'm like, you know what they did to me? And the next day I wake up and I'm like, what is wrong with you, sister? We have this friend that, uh, in the program and he does this whole bit on first thought wrong and, uh, and I know it. And I know it. And I tell the girls I sponsor all the time, take that first thought you have and throw it out and start all over again. Uh, evidently, I give advice, but I don't always take it. Because, you know, at the drop of a hat, I could just, you know, lose my mind and my program and, and you know, just be insane, just like I was a newcomer. Which is why 
I didn't get it, you know, I wasn't cured at 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, and I, I pretty much think I'm going to be here my whole life. Because, you know, what kind of a life do we have today, guys, that we didn't have before? Uh, you know, really, uh, but doing the things that we do, and our life has changed incredibly. My bucket list, I have far surpassed my bucket list. I bought a horse a few months ago, 60 years old, my first horse ever. I've been taking lessons, and um, i got a quick thing about that. I've been t- I, I, we, li- we just moved out to where it's rural, and... Um, I wanted to ride, so Pat leased me a horse. Stupidest thing I ever did. I would go out there every day. I don't know that much about horses. I'd saddle her up. I'd get on her. I'd just start riding. Thank God she was a good horse. I could have killed myself. Then I decided to start taking lessons in. So I'm taking lessons from this crotchety old guy. He's like this old cowboy type, you know, and um, he'll tell me ten things to do. When you get up there, I want you to blah, 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 and I'll do eight or nine of them. And he'll go, you know what? You didn't do number 10, you know, aren't you listening to me? And I'm like, Larry, dude, I just did nine of them. (laughs) What's with the 10? You know, lay off. And then, so I pay him in blocks of four. So I was on my second block of four, and I was was putting my boots on one night. I'm going to my lesson, and I'm like, you know what? Forget this old coot. All he does is bitch at me all the time. He doesn't see what I do. First thought, there I'm going, first thought, you know what? I got two more lessons. I might not even go to those either, but I'm going to go tonight, and I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to grip my teeth, and I'm going to get through it, and blah, blah, blah. So I go to the lesson that night, and you know what? I don't know what happened, but my butt stayed in the saddle. The horse was a little ornery. She paid attention to me. I was sitting right. I got 10 out of that 10 list that night, and I got done, and Larry says to me, did you feel it? He goes, did you feel it? Because I saw it. He said, I saw it in you. Did you feel it? And I'm like, yeah, I felt it. I didn't know that you saw it, though. And he's like, you're getting it. You're getting it. And so I was like, oh, yeah. Sign me up for another block of those lessons. Because (laughs) I I got this thing, and then a couple months later, I was like, I need to buy a horse. So then I bought a horse, and uh, she turns out to need a little more work than I thought she needed. But we're working on that, too. And I'm like, whoo buys a horse at 60 because you guys tell me I could do whatever I want I mean I I learned to ski I was almost 40 when I was 50 I got braces because I hated my teeth you know now at 60 I'm getting a horse it's like why not huh I got a couple years I mean I'm going to be here for another 50 so oh all right I got one more story because that made me think the the meeting I go to was full of a bunch of old ladies and they're dying off like crazy because when I turned 50 my friend was 100 and I was kind of whining oh god i can't believe i'm 50 i'm like almost this is almost over i'll be dying soon and she's like honey i'm like twice your age so step back (laughs) but this other lady dorothy lorraine uh um you know she was like in her mid 80s and we had a meeting one day and somebody sets the topic and we go around we're all discussing it and all of a sudden somebody changed the topic and said something about their sex life somebody else talks about the topic and then it's sex life and then sex life and then the topic and then more sex life so Dorothy Lorraine raises her hand and she said I didn't know that uh we we're going to be changing the topic today and we're like "Ooh, the old timer speaks <laughs> E.F. Hutton you know, so we're all like, oh, what's Dorothy Lorraine going to say? She goes, I didn't know we were changing the topic to uh, sex because uh, I got something to say. And we're like, oh, all right. And she said, if I, if I would have known that the last time that I had sex was going to be the last time that I had sex, I sure as hell would have paid a lot more attention. <laughs> 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 these are my heroes. <laughs> I love these chicks. I just I love these chicks. So today I'm standing in front of you, calling myself an Alanonic, but really, truly, in my heart, I am a grateful member of the Worldwide Fellowship, the Alanon Family Group. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.